The most radical step you can make if you're a Democrat is endorsing Donald Trump. So there are political calculations involved, there are ideological calculations, but there are also, of course, personal calculations. How, so you know, once you do that, you've burned your boats, like that's it. You're not going back to wherever you were 10 years ago. How hard a decision was that for you personally? It, it was a very good, it was an obvious decision for me. It should have been, but it was a very, very difficult decision. And we had, you know, I have a very, very good team around me and, um, I was most worried about my wife, um, who was uh, about Cheryl, who you know, who um, you know, it was not comfortable with. And she is a you know a lifelong Democrat. She comes from she's not the aristocracy. She comes from a very you know, uh, I would say poor family in in North Florida. But she found her way through uh, through idealism to the Democratic Party, and that, um, and she shares a lot of those values. So it was, and her industry is very, very much um, aligned with the Democratic Party, probably more than any industry in our country and more than any uh, town in our country. So this, um, was, for me, was likely to have huge impacts on her. And ultimately, if she had told me, you can't do this, I wouldn't have done it. So, um, but I'm very, I'm very grateful that she overcame, she allowed me to do it. She was not embracing it, but she said, I understand why you have to do this. And um, her, and we had a, like a four-day meeting and up in Hyannisport, my home, where kind of everybody, my family members, my kids, many other people, uh, Tony Robbins, uh, uh, I, I attended remotely and a number of other kind of spiritual leaders, just people who care deeply about our country, um, chimed in and and made cases on both sides. And people from the organiza campaign organization did. But here was the calculus that ultimately was persuasive for me. Um, my, if I, all of our internal pro pro polling showed from the outset and if I stayed in the Democratic Party, I was going to get uh, President, Vice President Harris elected. 57 to 60% and even more, sometimes up to 66% of my voters, so my followers said that if I withdrew from the election, they were going to vote for Trump, which is ironic, by the way, Tucker, because President Trump and the RNC did nothing to prevent me from being on the ballots. Um, they didn't have a, a big major organization sending private private eyes out. You know, I the Democratic Party was interviewing literally everybody I've ever met in 70 years to, to collect dirt on me. I, I got a call. They've been doing that, for, I, I know for a fact, for over a year. As you know, yeah, and they had a, they were open about it. This is what we're going to do. So they put a person in charge of it named Liz Smith, who's uh, you know, um, who's that's the kind of person she is. She this is what she does. She does negative research on people and tries to character Liz Smith, them. Elliot Spitzer's old girlfriend. Yes, oh. and she was in charge of that team. And then uh, there was other people as well. Mary Beth Cahill had been my uncle Teddy's chief of staff, who I knew. And Liz Smith was in charge of the, of, you know, the negative research, what they call negative research euphemistically. And I got calls from, you know, for example, a guy that I met at an AA meeting 40 years ago, and he received a call. Most of my family members received calls, contacts, either texts or telephone calls from people who said, I, I'm doing intelligence for the DNC, and, you know, we'd like to talk to you about Robert Kennedy and if you have any negative information about him. So I was getting that, uh, you know. What could possibly be the justification for that? Well, they didn't want me running. And that's the thing is it's not democratic. It wasn't, you know. That's such a mafia tactic. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, but the point is it was weird. It was, it was not smart because I was actually helping the Democrats. And if they just let me stay in and they didn't, run this campaign against me, they probably would win this election. And because I was hurting Trump, oddly, Trump didn't do anything about it. He's, you know, he was kind of, uh, 
he made a couple of statements about me that I was a communist, et cetera. But they were sort of good natured, you know, the stuff that you that you're like, okay, that's okay. They weren't like calling my old girlfriend saying, you know, <laughs> what you know, what did he do? Or, you know, whatever what they were asking him. So um <laughs> but the DNC was up to that. And uh and were you shocked by that? Was I shocked? I don't know. I mean, I was, I'm, I feel like I'm, uh, I'm in a place now where nothing surprises yeah, me. Anymore. I bet you are. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but, um, I, uh, I don't know. I mean, it, I, I, anyway. So they're the, going to uh, drop all that stuff now, obviously, right? What? They're going to get rid of Liz Smith and put her on some other project? I don't know. I just, you sort oh, of you wonder how does Liz Smith it? live with herself? I mean, that's so repulsive. Like, how does she justify that to herself? I have to, I mean, and I, I matter she's not stupid, um, but it, that is disgusting. No, the, I mean, you've lived a life famously and if you have a team of researchers digging into it. And I have not led a careful life, by the way. Well, I, mean, I know. I said, you know, my first, my first, um, during my announcement speech, I said, you know, I, I had told my wife this, told Cheryl this a couple of days before, I said, I have so many skeletons in my closet that if they could vote, I, I could run for king of the world. <laughs> oh, I, I know stuff's going to come out about me because I led, let me put it, a colorful life. Yeah. And, um, and you know, people have all kinds of stories about me, but so I was, I'm ready for, you know, I'm ready for, I, I listen, I've never done anything criminal in terms of like, this, this, this is stealing money or self-enrichment. I did a lot of stupid stuff and a lot of. Have you gotten rich off pointless foreign wars? No, I have not done that yet. Oh, you haven't. Okay. You haven't forced people to inject <laughs> <laughs> no, substances in their bodies. Okay. No, I've never done any of that, but. Anyway, so it became clear to me that if if Kamala got elected, the issues that I cared about, which is ending the foreign wars, um, you know, the, the unjust wars, the immoral wars, the wars of choice like Ukraine, um, stopping the censorship, which I think is existential for our democracy, and then protecting children from this extraordinary exploding chronic disease epidemic. Those are the three reasons that got me into the campaign. That's why I ran for president. Those are three reasons. That if she got elected, I'm 70 years old, that eight years from now, our kids are going to be lost. And that, and if she's president for eight years, my chance to do anything about it would be gone. Yes. And that, and then I got a contact from Callie Means, who you know well. Yes. Who you've you know made one of Talked the best you know, one of the best shows um, ever put on TV, ever aired. Was your interview with Callie and his wife Casey and Callie? For those of you who haven't seen the show, his his show is a um, is an expert, a, a genius, brilliant, articulate, eloquent, and incredible encyclopedic knowledge on the food system and what is corrupting it, what is causing the corruption at FDA, at USDA, that the, the capture of those agencies by the processed food industry, by the chemical industry, by the pharmaceutical industry, that actually profit on sick children. One of the things that Callie says, there is nothing more profitable in our society today than a sick child because it, all of these entities are making money on them. The insurance companies, the hospitals, the, the, the medical cartel, the pharmaceutical companies have lifetime annuities. I mean, any child that, and the earlier that kid is sick, they don't want to kill them. They want them sick for the rest of their lives. And we have now a whole generation, when my uncle was president, 6% of Americans had chronic disease today is 60%. When my uncle was president, do you know what the... The uh, the cost, the annual cost of treating chronic disease was in this country, zero. There weren't even any drugs invented for it, zero. Today it's about four point three trillion dollars. When your uncle was and, president, and none of it is necessary. What what was the autism rate in nineteen sixty? Do we know? In nineteen sixty, the autism rate 
there's about four, five studies, and the 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 the, the highest rate say about one in twenty five hundred, one in fifteen hundred, one in twenty five hundred, one in ten thousand. Oh, um, so that you know it was it was somewhere between one in fifteen hundred and one in ten thousand. Today, it's one in every 34 kids, according to the CDC. And in some states, like California, I think maybe Utah and New Jersey, one in 22. One in 22 kids. And, you know, these kids should be healthy. These kids should be our, our highest performing kids. And they instead are, are you know, have this extraordinary disability that's going to keep them dependent uh, um, and not... You know, a lot of these, if you're full-blown autism, you know, it's a non-verbal, non-toilet trained, uh, head-banging, stimming, toe-walking. These are kids that will never throw baseball. They'll never graduate high school. They'll never go out, take a girl on a date. Oh. They'll never use the toilet alone. They'll, um, they'll never write a play. They'll never write a poem. They'll never vote. Never have children. Never pay taxes. So that just seems like such a, an emergency. And for me, yeah, for me, like if I could save one of these kids, it would be worth giving my life for it. I'm 70 years old. To save one kid at birth, it would be worth dying for. And to the opportunity and the need for me to save all of these kids, um, I would do anything for. I would literally do anything for it. We were talking breakfast. I'm sure your perception is different because we're talking about you. But, you know, for 15 years anyway, there was not a single story about you that didn't dismiss you as a dangerous crackpot for questioning why autism is much more common than it once was. Much more. I mean, exponentially more common. And you've written a lot about this and you were attacked. I don't see those attacks very much anymore. Uh, well, they're still in the mainstream media. That's still part of the... You know the litany of 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 my crimes, um, but you know anybody who uses their head, any of and they and that's one of the reasons they won't let me speak on the media. I mean, when when Ross Perot ran, he he was running for ten months. He was on mainstream media thirty four times interviews, um, and you remember him. He was on. It seemed like he was on Larry King every week. Of course. Um, but, and I got in 16 months, I had two live interviews on all of those networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, uh, MSNBC, two. And <laughs> I, and the, and the, you know, they're just basically mouthpieces now for the DNC. And there was this bl obligatory litany of defamations and pejoratives that were used to describe me anytime I mentioned, my name was mentioned, you know, that I was not a crackpot. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like a super villain. So, and I'm not complaining because that's, that's just, you know, I, I knew what I was getting into. Um, but anyway, the idea that, um, you know, I had these meetings with President Trump and they were partly because of you. You know, you were the one who, uh, Callie Means called me about, I'd say three hours after President Trump was shot. Callie Means, call, although it doesn't seem possible because, uh, but I think it was only three hours after yes. his shooting. Um, and, it was Saturday night. Yeah, Saturday night. And and, he, and Callie Means said to me, um, you know, he told me, he, Callie had been advising me for a long time and my campaign. He told me that night, I've also been, uh, I've been, advising President Trump, which delighted me because I thought, oh my gosh, there's another candidate beside me that is is listening to the truth. And um, he said that, uh, that there was interest in the Trump campaign by the president of, of including me. And then it, he talked about vice president, which I wasn't interested in. And, but he said, you know, would you be interested in talking with the Trump, um, with President Trump? And I said, I don't think so. And then, and part of this was, I just thought it was a non-starter with Cheryl. And I called Cheryl up and she um, said to me, you should hear them out. And Smart. I immediately called Callie, I texted Callie back and said, I'm interested. And then I got a text from you. 
and you and I have each other's cell phones, and you had an unknown cell phone number, which you had linked me into, which was President Trump's number, and you said, you know, he's waiting for your call. And so I called him that night. I had a great conversation with him, and then um, he and he asked. Well, we decided to talk, and I met him the next day. He was at that point at uh, Bedminster, which is his golf course and home in New Jersey, and he had he'd driven there from Butler, where he had been shot, and then I went to. Um, and so I flew out to many, Minneapolis the next day, and I had a uh, probably a two-hour meeting with him and Amaryllis, who's my daughter-in-law, who is running my campaign, the smartest person I've ever met, and Cheryl and Susie Wiles. And uh, it was a really interesting meeting because he was so open about um, about, first of all, not liking the neocons. Yeah. And, you know, I never imagined that because I, you know, for me, he was the guy who brought John Bolton and Mike Pompeo into office. And, you know, but he was uh, really uh, disillusioned with them, to say the least, you know. And then, you know, he was he was uh, deeply interested and, and well-informed uh, as he is on any, you know, as as much as he is on any subject, um, about what's what's happening to our kids, uh, chronic disease, and then he was absolutely adamant about stopping the censorship and you know and making sure that we had free speech, and so we talked a little then and uh, didn't really come to any, you know, talked about the possibility of working together. After that, and that. But then we we put it on hold. I, they wanted me to do something at the convention. I said no. I, I'm not going to do that. And um and we still at that point there was a, still a chance that I could get into the debate. That chance was diminishing, and because I was not allowed on any media, and because um and the, you know my really my only chance of winning the election. I believe I would have won if I had gotten on a debate stage. And my only chance was to get on the debate stage. And it was that was that uh, possibility was vanishing. And um, so I was looking at kind of my options. I then contacted Harris's campaign because I thought I should talk to them and see if they're interested in any of these issues, which I suspected they were not because a camel then was still an empty, you know, an empty slate. Um, Kamala, excuse me, she was an empty slate. So you know, she's pronounced it both ways herself. So it's okay. It's, it's uh, you know, I want to, I want to respect people and give them, yes. you know, um, so I, I reached out to her, and I reached out through a number of people, who, including some relatives of mine, who are very, very close to her personally into the Democratic Party, and they just said, that's a non-starter. There's no way in the world that she's going to talk to you. And they said, we can we can get you a meeting with a low-level campaign official. And I said, um, okay, I'm, I'm not interested in that. Why wouldn't, it's, it's interesting, why wouldn't Kamala Harris meet with you? Maybe the same reason that she hasn't given an interview. You know, I think it seems to me that there's a lot of handlers involved and that, and you know, even when you talk to Democrats about, you know, do you really think it's a good idea to be um, electing somebody who cannot give an interview? They say, well, you're not electing her; you're electing the people around her. You're electing the apparatus, and the apparatus, but the apparatus, an apparatus, I don't have any faith in. It's an apparatus run that are neocons, like you know, like Anthony Blinken, and. Uh, and who are, you know, running us right up into a World War III. And there are people who, you know, who mastermind the censorship from inside the White House. That's the apparatus that they want to reelect. And to me, that's an apparatus that has no... These are the people who are censoring me. These are the people who try to throw me out of the party, who canceled the primaries. That's the apparatus, 
you know, if it was a Democrat who said, I can think on my own, I understand what this country is supposed to look like. I understand what, what democracy is supposed to look like. And I, you know, and I think that's great. Great. Let's do that.